Welcome to the D6 Family Ministry Podcast, a place where ideas, principles, and personalities come together to give you a ministry advantage that empowers the church and home. I don't know anything more important in our society or in the kingdom of God than to help the church help the family. Discipleship is not an event, it's a way of life. And one day it just hit me that discipleship at home was not about doing more. It was about inviting Christ into what we were already doing. The goal of family ministry is not families sitting on the couch, holding hands and singing Kumbaya. The ultimate goal is families that love God, love people and make disciples of all peoples. So that's why you're here. You're here to say one hour a week, as significant and as awesome as it is, we know that it's not enough and we want to be intentional with every hour. You're listening to the D6 Podcast. Here are your hosts, Marianne Howard, Ron Hunter, and Josh Wooten. We are back this week with Carissa Potter and she knocks this interview out of the park and really gives some great perspective on some very hard topics. Yeah, she does. <laughs> and I'll just I'll just kind of drop a little um teaser in there for our listeners. She's going to go after me-centered doctrine. Me-centered doctrine, me-centered church, me-centered, me-centered, me-centered and just kind of how we got there and you know, really help you evaluate if you're theology is you centered or God centered. And so she brings up a really awesome analogy to how we um, read the Bible. She talks about a yearbook and I can't wait for our listeners to hear her take on a yearbook and how we see a yearbook a certain way. So I'll just let that kind of be a segue into the interview. But so before we get into the interview, Ron, I wanted to ask you when you were growing up and in high school, did you get your yearbook every year and what did you do with your yearbook or what, what is your feelings or take our opinion on a yearbook? Yeah. Um, wow. First of all, I need to share that I was not the cool kid. I, okay. I was in the right circle. Don't get me wrong. I, and that's due to all the other reasons other than being cool. Okay. So I was in the right circles and it's funny you say that. I'm looking over to a shelf on my left immediately, and all my yearbooks are sitting there. Okay. okay? That should that should say something in what few books I have surrounding me. Yes. Because they're part of memory. They're, they're kind of part of legacy, good, bad, and otherwise. Mm-hmm. Um, but if Fair. you open up my yearbooks, I am not pleased with my pictures in there. I was This was the way I referred to myself back then, and I hope you guys understand this. <laughs> I was a zit farm. Okay. You know, um, my face was just broken out all over. I battled that all through high school, mm-hmm. but I was the yearbook editor and uh, okay. I enjoyed the graphic design, the layout, the creativity, you know, all of that part. And yes, I enjoyed what it represented of our school. Mm-hmm. So yeah. How about and you? Look, and look how God used that <laughs> to shape the role you're in now. In yes. Public. I yes. mean, that's just interesting. Little did you, we know. Little did we so, know. That's yeah. so interesting. That's an interesting detail about you that I didn't know. Yeah. I was so the girl of, I got my yearbook every year. I yep. had everybody sign it. I, 10th grade, I had really bad acne. They called me Pizza Hut. And then from transition from 10th grade to 11th grade, it cleared up. And oh, it was wow. like, they didn't even recognize me in 11th grade. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Mine and, followed me to college. I, I'm a little jealous. Oh, oh yeah, man. It's yeah. tough. I'm telling it you. Is. Acne is. is not a fun season. No. But everyone goes through it. I pull up to the junior high to pick up my junior high son every every day. And I'm like, oh, yeah, they all look the same. Braces, Crocs, <laughs> and acne. <laughs> so funny. So, yeah, I had a lot of fun with my um, yearbook. And just so you guys know, like, 
Yearbook for my stage of life and and even Ron's stage of life really functioned as our Facebook, our modern Facebook. It was analog Facebook. And so I will just be really honest with you. I was at a very different stage in life and there were years that I was considered in the mean girls group. And Mm. so some of my yearbooks have certain, like I would draw people's faces with Sharpie (laughs) and it's just, I'm being, this is a confessional today. It, it, it is, it's, well, honestly, Honestly, it's a segue into this interview yeah. because I was very me centered as a teenager and that is what she kind of highlights. And so we're going to lead into Carissa Potter's interview and she's so wise. You are going to take a lot of notes on this interview. So just be ready. And I can't wait to talk with you about this on the other side. Imagine families in your church thriving in their faith, blossoming with engagement, kids who are curious and excited, parents who are inspired, and the unmistakable sound of joyous discipleship echoing through your halls. Yes, it's possible. Even in today's whirlwind of schedules and screens, your church can be a haven of family faith. But let's face it, reaching families today is tough. The changing landscape, the distractions, the packed calendars, That's exactly why there's D6 HomePoint, a beacon of support for churches striving to strengthen family discipleship. Our strategic model is crafted to meet the needs of churches just like yours, all across the country. Join the hundreds of churches that have witnessed the beautiful transformation of families and the blooming of ministries with our proven approach. Our resources are as diverse as your congregation. From on-campus programs to dynamic online tools, we provide a treasure trove of customizable materials that blend seamlessly into the fabric of your unique church community. Don't let this opportunity pass your church by. To find out how D6 HomePoint can revitalize family discipleship in your community, visit d6homepoint.com. Today, I am joined by Carissa Potter. Carissa loves to think outside the box. She is a prominent voice advocating for families to be recognized as having a key role in the Great Commission. The founder and director of VIA Families, Carissa has helped parents and leaders in more than a dozen countries through training, resourcing, and consulting. She co-authored Parenting with a Global Vision. Carissa, thanks for being here today. Thanks so much for having me. Well, we are talking about a topic that has taken the culture by storm, and mm-hmm. I don't think necessarily in a good way. <laughs> yes. And that is being me-centered versus God-centered. Mm-hmm. Now, I would love to say that we could just say this is completely outside the church, mm. and we don't really need to worry about it inside the church, but that would be a lie. Yeah, we are be. seeing yeah. this hit the church hard. Our society has run fast toward this me-centered individualistic approach. Mm-hmm. What's led us to this point? There's really several factors, and you have to really look at history to see what got us to where we are. I mean, as we think about really the Western world, specifically the U.S., you know, our country was really founded in individualistic principles. It was people coming away from Europe seeking self-improvement, freedom. We had westward expansion, the gold rush. All this was driven by, you know, capitalism and the, and the ability to succeed, which created this cultural value of individual, which is very different than the majority of the world. And so that feeds and becomes the filter through which we see so much. But we also have so many other factors that bleed into that, you know, our developmental uh, process and how as in, we're in our early ages, we're in this preoccupational stage where we are more me-centered just naturally and how we're developing and grow. But then you put that in a culture that values individualism and then it really feeds that rather than children growing out of that. We've seen generational shifts since uh, the 60s with all of our wonderful teenagers that were hippies and wanting fun and self-actualization. It really started to shift this and cause this generational trend that has just continued to grow through each generation of becoming more me-oriented up until Gen Z where we literally put the t- tools in their hands to live that out with technology, but also in spiritual formation. We have to remember that up until the printing press, the Bible was only ever read in community. We didn't have individual Bibles for our daily devotions that we could have every morning. Now, that's not a bad thing, 
But we have to see even just how that shift has impacted spiritual formation and how we look at discipleship. Mm. Now, for those of us who have grown up in the church, that me-centered philosophy should feel weird, especially Mm -hmm. when we read the Bible's teachings on sacrificial love. But what has made that self-focused mindset so appealing to the outside world? I really feel like um, there's probably so many factors, but I think one factor that sends out to me is I think it gives people a just really false sense of freedom. Because if it's just about me and my truth and living my life and pursuing my dreams, like I don't have to fulfill the pressures of somebody else. I don't have to please other people. I don't even have to make consideration for other people. Um, and it's really, I think, allows them to feel like this, again, false sense of freedom and peace that they get to pursue their own thing and just drown out the, vo- the outside voices. And really, I think subconsciously it's a way of avoiding suffering because I am, if I don't have to associate with other people and I put me first, then I don't have to enter into that suffering that comes through relationships and living in community. Um, and so I think that a lot of those things get factored in there. Yeah, it sounds like a like shame avoidance yeah. almost that if you can just like you said live mm-hmm. my truth then I don't have to worry about anything else yeah. and I can avoid I don't that. have yeah. to feel guilty I don't have to feel sorry any of those things Yeah well to turn things a little more inward mm-hmm. how has that me centered mindset made its way into the church Yeah we definitely didn't create it but we can definitely reinforce it and I think a lot of times it's so subconscious Um, We have these cultural filters based on where we live and our ethnicity and where we grew up. And they become the lenses through which we perceive everything, whether we realize it or not. And so, especially for Western believers, but this, you know, the West has had massive influence around the world, especially with globalization. So this is becoming true in other places as well. We bring those lenses to the Bible. Mm -hmm. And so the Bible was written in a collectivistic society and community, but we try to perceive it through the the lenses of individualism. I mean, even our English language doesn't allow for that. Like nine out of 10 times in the Bible, the word you is meaning like you all, but we don't have a word for that. We only have a singular you. We don't have a plural you like most languages do. So even when we read verses that says like you are the living stone or that God is building you up, like we think about, oh me, he's building me up but he's really saying, like, all of you together are being built up. Like, we it's all within community. And we tend to, even when we look at Scripture, we kind of train our children every time they come to the Bible to say, first and foremost, what does this say to me? Like, mm-hmm. not a bad thing. Again, not a bad thing. But when that is, like, our primary focus, when the first person we look for in the Bible is me, not God, it communicates to us that we are the main characters, but we're not the main characters. God is the main character in the story of, God, of, of his word. And so it's um, just in the way we even frame everyday Bible stories, how we look at verses, we tend to just really hyper fixate on it. You know, like when you get your yearbook at the end of the year and you just like flip through <laughs> to see like all the pictures of yourself. Um, and so that's kind of how we end up coming to the word of God. And again, we, we don't see it so often. It's so subconscious. Um, and we think, oh, yeah, we love God. We love the world. We love his mission. We love what he's doing. We want to give our all. But those things are just happening in the background in our mind, and they're influencing our faith formation. Mm. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, I want to ask you a little bit more about how that is influencing our view of Scripture, because I think that's important for us to discuss. We'll be right back. Are you concerned about your church's future? Will it serve another generation? The Bible says he is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And yet we often only know how to connect to Abraham. Let D6 help you connect with each generation. Your kids and grandkids are counting on you. D6 comes from the principles of Deuteronomy 6 and helps what happens in church also happen at home. Curriculum you can trust. Discipleship that connects. We are back and we're talking to Carissa Potter about living in a me-centered versus God-centered world. Now, before the break, we talked about a little bit how that this me-centered approach is affecting our view of Scripture. Our kids today are growing up in a society that preaches that self-love is the greatest form of love and you are your number one priority. 
what potential damage might that be causing to today's youth and especially how they view scripture and how they read scripture? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, in 2005, they did a study and it revealed that the average teenager believes, generally, like genuinely believes, that God exists to do the will of man. Oh, whoa, whoa. Um, hold on. Say, yeah. that, say that again. I didn't yes. think that's where you were going. I thought, okay, this sounds good so far. Say yeah. that one more time because you caught me off guard there. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this is in 2005, so this is a long time ago, but I think it still rings true today that that their belief is that God exists to do our will. Like he serves us. He's a good God. He does good things. Um, not that we exist to do the will of God. That's a very significant theological uh, shift um, in this generation. And so it's something we have to be mindful of. And I think our approach to spiritual formation in the past has really led us there, again, unintentionally. When I first started serving in children's ministry in college, um, I don't remember what our curriculum was, but um, I remember noticing, like I did first through third grade, and every single lesson was like, God takes care of me. God helps me. God loves me. God protects me. Who's the focus in that? It's me. Mm -hmm. And that tells me God exists for me because he does all these things for me rather than the focus on who God is and his character and what he's doing. And I think, you know, we struggle to live in paradox that two things can be completely true at the same time that seem to oppose one another, that it can be about God, that he is the center, that he will not yield his glory to another but also that he deeply loves me and I am made in his image and I have been created to do good works. Like we have a hard time believing that both of those things can exist at the same time in our mind and be equally true. Um, and so we tend to gravitate one towards the other. And so uh, our spiritual formation can become about self gratification. It's kind of like the apple a day keeps the doctor away mentality. Like I'm coming to God's word to fulfill me and to feel better about myself and to have peace for myself. Now, God does give those things, but they're in the context of His glory and who He is as a God and that we worship Him through that versus just wanting to be fed by that. Yeah, when you were saying that, I, like my mind went to like the movie Aladdin and thinking like it's like our society views God as the genie. That, yes. Uh -huh. And whether you, depending on your age, listening, it's Robin Williams or Will Smith, but <laughs> it's like we, we want God to grant us our wishes and do what we command. That's, mm -hmm. that's wild because when you read scripture, that's not what you see. We, we see a, a different view of God, but that's how we've applied it today. And I know even some of our worship songs are very me-centered. Yes, it's about my much. blessings. Yeah. Wow. Um, so kind of getting beyond this, how can we begin to help our youth look beyond God's blessings for them and discover his bigger purpose in scripture? Yeah, we have to be really intentional about how we frame it and that we're giving them the full story. I mean, so many everyday stories and verses. Psalms 4610, what is it? Be still and know that I am God. There's another half to that verse. I used to work in a Christian bookstore. It was on posters. It was on shirts. It was on bookmarks, Bible covers. I never knew the second half of the verse. It says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations, I will be exalted in all the earth. You know, we love the verses like, may God bless you and make his face shine upon you. Psalm 67, the next part of that verse is so that your ways may be known on earth, your salvation among all nations. Like the blessing is in the context of purpose. Like God blesses us so that we can be a blessing. We see that all the way in Genesis 12, like Abraham, I'm going to make you in a great nation. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to do all those things. God was doing all those things. What was Abraham's one job? And you will be a blessing. And through you, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. And so when we talk about, you know, stories like David, like Daniel, the Samaritan woman, we need to make sure that we're giving them the whole story. Yeah, Daniel was rescued from the lion's den, and that was an incredible blessing that he was not lunch for the lions, and God protected Daniel and for his obedience. But we see just a few verses further. Just keep going a little bit more. King Darius is so impacted by this encounter. He's a Gentile king. He's not a, a God follower. That he ends up writing a letter and a decree to all the surrounding nations and tribes saying Daniel's God is the true and living God. Like God used that event in Daniel's life to help others like learn and know about him. And our kids need to see God's blessing within that bigger context. Yeah. Well, as we're talking, I can 
people are coming to mind who I know are le- living these me-centered lives. They've adopted this mentality and this philosophy. And to be honest, they're miserable. Mm-hmm. I-, I think they're lonely in this because they've eventually shut people out of their lives. I think they're a tad narcissistic <laughs> in how they live. Yeah. And ultimately, it just leads to sadness and destruction. Mm. So, But looking at a more hopeful picture, how will that shift from me-centered to God-centered change someone's life? Yeah, I think in the same way that pursuing it is giving you a false sense of freedom and peace, I think embracing it gives you a true sense of freedom and peace. Because now it's not about me. I am not the most important thing on planet Earth. But I get to be a part of the most important thing on planet Earth. It's not my story. I mean, I remember as a kid just dreaming about being like my own character in a storybook and what was the ending of my story. It's not my story. God isn't writing my story. I'm a chapter in a larger story, and I get to join with all these other characters and people throughout church history in this greater story, and that is a sense of belonging and community. And so as as much as this generation is seeking self-fulfillment and self-actualization, they're also seeking to be a part of something bigger, to belong. They want community because they're not finding it in social media. And um, I think that is healing to them when they begin to walk into that and realize that their experience of God as at the center, that everything they do being influenced by that doesn't take away from his love for them and their value as an individual, it, I, my feeling, it, is, it enhances it. Yeah. Because it's not about me, yet God still invites me into his story, and that puts value on my life. Yeah, well, what you've shared is tremendous. If, if you work with youth in any capacity, whether you're at a church or you're a teacher, I'm sure you're seeing this firsthand daily. Uh, so I, I know our listeners are going shaking their heads and going, yeah, I completely understand what she's talking about. But if we just pointed the finger at the youth, we'd probably be doing that a misservice because this is occurring with young adults. This is occurring with baby boomers, you know, Gen X, anybody you can throw in this category. We are struggling with that, this in this me-centered world. Carissa, thank you for sharing this. I think this is information that will help us teach and reach youth, but it's also some information that might we might need to take personal inventory of to realize if we've adopted some of these ways. So thank you yeah, so much. You're welcome. Did you know that some of the yearbooks actually have an index in the back to where you can find your name and then find every page number that you can spot yourself throughout mm. the yearbook? I'm going to have to go look. It, may, I, I, it makes me <laughs> want to revisit and remind myself how many of mine had those in there. And what Carissa said that you so brilliantly set up this uh, segment for, she said, we often approach God's word. How'd mm-hmm. she say it? Like we do yearbooks looking for ourselves on every page. Yes. Man, oh. that's indicting. That's convicting. It is. Do we really it, go to the Bible with a personal index going, let me find myself there? Yeah. Probably not the index, but yes, we read that way, don't we, at times? We do. And I, I just loved her challenge of when we're teaching, and it is a huge responsibility. I mean, there are big implications when we divide the Word of God, when we teach yes. God's Word. And are we making the main character of the Bible about God? And are, are we making sure even generationally as, as I'm teaching God's word to teenagers that they understand the meta narrative of the Bible mm. and not just this, you know, it's this collection of stories. No, it is a meta narrative. It's a redemptive story. It's a holistic story that where God is at work and where he's faithful. And we're really, mm-hmm. to be honest with you, Ron, just to kind of come alongside exactly what Carissa said is it's really the, the, the fragility and the brokenness and the yes. messiness of humans that makes yes. God so much bigger in this story. Yeah. Why is it, you know, to take that fragility, you know, we're looking to be reinforced and not fragile. We're looking to be, to gain our confidence. We're looking for answers to our wants, our needs, our problems. Yeah. And yet we're looking for self as we open up God's word rather than looking for Christ. That's mm-hmm. what Chris is saying to us. Mm-hmm. Why can't we go in looking for him rather than looking for us? And what would it take for us to do that as we approach? Mm-hmm. Like, let me find Jesus in every day. Yeah. Let me find him in my reading. 
she made another statement. I want to see what you did with this because I will okay. tell you, I'm still thinking on this one. Um, okay. Her statement was when when they were in, and I know this from my love of the book of Nehemiah, when they were in the Old Testament, Bible reading was done in community. Mm -hmm. And she said, until the printing press came along, it was still done in community. And she didn't say this, but I'm going to fill in the gaps here, unless you are a priest, you know, you are a, you mm -hmm. know, one in a, a monk or somebody who had access to the scripture and you would read and prepare. So the average person did not have the, the personal word of God and it was always read in community. Mm -hmm. She doesn't make those long-term implications, but I want to marinate on that. You know, mm -hmm. I'm not sure that's God's design. It just was the practicality of, of what was happening. And yeah. what does that, what could that mean with, we spent more time in community reading it? Oh, yes. I think it's both. And I think he's a personal God. And so he wants to relate to us personally. And I'll just, you know, I think <sighs> I'm pausing because I, I want to think through my words here. But I think there have been some years in church world culture where there was an emphasis in transactional mm -hmm. reading of God's word. Like, I'm going to reward you with this, with these tokens, if you learn these scriptures and there was a detachment from a personal God. And so yeah. I just want to, I want to, I want to tiptoe into this carefully, but very respectfully to say, God is a relational God yeah. and he wants, he's given us his word to know him. Yeah, that's <laughs> he's right. He's given us his word to know him. And to your point about reading God's word in community, I think we need to fight to do that more. Um, I love that she brought that up because I think that brings further insight into helping me connect relationally to God, because you may have insight that I don't have, you That's know, right. and you're filled with the Holy Spirit. And so just yeah. as you're reading and he's revealing to you that what a powerful thing. And can I just also say this also continues to emphasize our heart at D6 family yeah. that that families are coming around God's word together. And that's how it was celebrated. That's Deuteronomy six. Yes. You know, <laughs> as I, as I teach a life group, that's some of the questions that, uh, you know, we, I teach D six curriculum and we never open up with application questions. Like, what does this mean to you? That's the worst question in the world, mm -hmm. you know, but the question is, here's what God intends for us to take away. How yeah. then are you feeling it applied to your life? And, yeah. I tend to look at it through a me centric, but when I hear somebody else looking at it through their application, I'm going, oh, I'm challenged. I'm mm -hmm. learning by the application of it to somebody else's life that I may be looking at it through a narrow lens. And that's what I love about discussion in small groups on, on mm -hmm. Sunday mornings. But we often talk about that around the dinner table with our families. What is God saying to you that's based right. on what we just read? Yeah. And that you're right, that Deuteronomy 6 be intentional with those conversations, get to rise to the top, and for us to think less about self. Mm -hmm. yeah. One of my favorite books I've read, apart from God's Word, that's probably in my top five, and it's not even a Christian book, and I'll give credit. I'll, I'm looking over at my shelf now to make sure I get the name of the author right. Stephen Johnson, um, How We Got to Now. I'm not necessarily, I would recommend it. But I just need you to know there are evolutionary emphasis in this book, but it's the five, I think, greatest inventions the world has ever seen, the Western world. Mm -hmm. One of them in there is glass, and it takes it down to the point of glass became ornamental, something we wear, colored you know, gems, things of that nature, to the ability to correct lenses, to see far in a telescope. It had mm -hmm. such implications, but then when polished had the ability to self-reflect. Wow. So wow. when we look at God's word, it's self-reflect, not for magnifying self, mm -hmm. but to use like a mirror to correct self. That's right. And so when I read that book, How We Got to Now, and I started thinking about the power of self-reflection and then how Satan can take something that's good and put it into selfie. Oh, mm -hmm. let's take a selfie. Let me promote me. Let me. Mm -hmm. And that's what Carissa is talking to us about mm -hmm. is the the abandonment of God's principle to champion myself over his message all day long. Yeah. And I think 
you know, that's, that's idolatry. And yes. we, you've probably heard the title and I think it's Tim Keller that calls us like the heart is an I, perpetual idol factory. Yes. And I also think going back to what you're saying, and David alluded to this in some of his, he was talking about, you know, we see God as a genie. I say to teenagers all the time, because they really relate to this, that, that we've got to be careful that we don't treat God as a vending machine for our personal happiness. And mm. I've even like had a vending machine present so that I could use it as an illustration point. He's not a vending machine for our personal happiness. If we're treating him that way, then we think we're central. We've climbed up onto the throne as, as Lord and Savior. Yeah. And God is just what he can do for me to make me happy. Yeah. And, and that's that is totally not. I want to just say this so clear, and it's exactly what Carissa said. That is not the God of the Bible. Yeah. That, that's not the God of the Bible. And we read it in totality. And the bigger picture is he's going to use us for his glory. But the bigger picture, the greater story is him. He yeah. is the one getting the glory and the fame. And it's about his character. And really, when we're reading the text in scripture, it's what does this say about God? Yes. What does this say about God? What does this say about God? Because when we really reflect, as you said, on God and hold this heart and life and mind up to the God of the Bible, it changes us. Yes, it does. <laughs> it does. And, and, you know, going to that vending machine, it should mm -hmm. be punching up what we want. It should be punching up the gospel for others it should be let me let me take something out of this we can share together not what what can i selfishly take if that vending yeah. machine application gets turned to the good i right. love that statement that is yeah. powerful yeah. yeah and i wanted i loved how she ended the interview ron i love that she said give kids the whole story yeah I, that i hope that our listeners really hear that because the implications of giving them the whole story and not yeah. making it about them, but making it about God changes the world. It yes. changes the world. So give them the whole story. Be sure that you're painting the story of the Bible as God is the hero. The, yeah. Listen, this generation, they don't want to be the hero. They know they're not. Yeah. I, yeah. I know that we're seeing, you know, there's a lot of self and me and all those kinds of things, but they're realizing as they're living life, teenagers in particular, and young adults moving into college, yeah. they're realizing, oh my gosh, I am not the center of the world. And this is such a crazy world. I need... I need a hero. Yeah. And the hero is God, is Jesus. That's right. That's <laughs> right. Yeah, we we are not to look to God like a tool to to manipulate what we want. We're a tool in God's hands to build something special that he wants. That's right. That's, so right. that's, that's where right. we should be going. Well, next week we have Jonathan Concrite and uh he is going to uh really help us as we work to recognize Let's kind of take this from what Chris has done and go a little bit further. You know, help us recognize God at work. Remind yeah. our kids what God is going to do is a phrase he's going to, to drop mm -hmm. on us. And I really like that. So until then, we're going to pray that uh, we, uh, this is kind of the second time we've hit that me theme. If we go back to Elisa Childers, you know, that progressive Christianity and Carissa Potter, these are kind of siblings in the same family. Mm -hmm. uh, she's she's not tackling progressive Christianity like El Elisa did, but the selfishness inside of all of us seems to be a common theme that uh, we see happening not only in the world, but it's, it's bled over into the church. So you might want to pick up both of these episodes, listen to them side by side and see how they relate. Mm -hmm. And we'll be praying for you until we get back together to hear from Jonathan Concrite. You've been listening to the D6 Podcast. You can learn more about D6 at d6family.com.